Well, the Fed can't escape the room. So if inflation stays where it is, the Fed can't get interest rates to a real level uh, without causing a recession, which will sink the stock market. But if even if inflation comes down a little bit, that'll be a sign of recession. So you're raising rates into a recession, which will cause a recession. You end up in a recession either way. Um, it's just a question of whether the Fed persists or throws in the towel. Now, we've seen this movie before. What's going on is an exact replay of what happened between 2013 and 2019. May 2013, Bernanke announces the taper. Expectation is they're going to start the taper in September. He chickens out. They start the taper in November 2013. They finish the taper in November 2014. Then here comes Yellen. She's going to raise rates. Take out the word patient from the, from the statement. She doesn't raise rates until December 2015. And then she doesn't raise them again until December 2016. They went a whole year between two 25 basis point rate cuts. And then here comes Powell and then boom, okay, 25 basis points, boom, boom, boom. Gets them up to two and a quarter, which is where they want it to be. And gets the balance sheet down to eh, about three and a half trillion. They want to get it down to about two and a half trillion. But he's, he's got rates about where he wants them. He's got the balance sheet on its way down. Uh, and uh, he's normalizing. And what happens? The stock market crashes 20% between October 1st, 2018 and December 24th, 2018. That was the famous Christmas Eve massacre where the stock market fell 3% in one day. But the Fed still tightening. The Fed tightened like a week before the Christmas Eve massacre. They tightened into the weakness. They were getting very close to crashing the stock market. They took it down 20% in three months, getting close to crashing it. So what happens next? First week of January, Powell comes out. Okay, we're not going to raise interest rates anymore. We're going to be patient. They use all these code words. We're going to be patient. Then he starts cutting rates. Then he starts QE. I forget if it was eight or nine, whatever. Lost, lost track of QE. He starts QE8, let's say. And then that takes you into 2020. And here comes the pandemic. And rates go down to zero. And the balance sheet goes to $7 trillion. They were back where they were in May of 2013. Except worse, because now the balance sheet was even bigger than it was then. A complete failure. So who thinks they're going to be more successful this time? They're doing the same thing. It's going to happen faster this time because the market saw that whole seven-year fiasco from May to 2013 to May 2020, a seven-year round-trip failure. The same thing's going to happen, but it's going to happen faster this time because like, the market knows that the Fed doesn't know what they're doing. So the Fed's tightening into weakness. One of two things is going to happen, and it's not clear which, but it's going to be one or the other. They're going to keep tightening and keep tightening and keep tightening, try to get a handle on inflation and crash the stock market. Or they're going to lose their nerve, back off on the tightening, and then inflation is just going to rip which will also crash the stock market. So take your pick, but um, it's going to be one or the other. But this idea of a soft landing is nonsense. The 2021 thesis was that, you know, inflation grew. Part of it was base effects because, you know, the, the way the government calculates inflation, it's monthly data compared to the year before. So it's year over year, monthly, then annualized. Uh, and so one could easily explain inflation in April, May, June 2021, because you were comparing it to 2020, which was the worst recession since 1946. But the base effects would run off uh, in September, October, November. But the inflation persisted, even though the base effects were gone. So now it's like, okay, this is real inflation. It's coming from somewhere else. It was coming from the supply chain, which the Fed can't do anything about either because the Fed doesn't drill for oil. They don't build pipelines and they don't grow wheat. The Fed can't do anything about any of those things. And that's where um, the war and the sanctions and the continuation of COVID played a role. So, you know, I just say you can, you can have your own uh, views, but you can't have your own data. The data is clear. The inflation is here. The supply chains are getting worse. But these supply chain disruptions didn't start with the war. They didn't even start with the pandemic. They started with Trump's trade war beginning in 2018. <laughs> I found a very good book on that uh, written by um, uh, Laurie and LaRocco. Uh, and what's interesting about her book is that she finished it in late 2019. So it's almost like a controlled experiment. It was pre-pandemic. It's easy to say that the pandemic disrupted the supply chain, which it did. And the war disrupted the supply chain, which it did. But here we have a very rigorous study of what was happening to supply chains before either one. And the answer is they were a mess. They were a mess back then because of tariffs on China and China redirecting soybean purchase orders from the United States to Brazil. That sounds easy because Brazil grows soybeans. Well, guess what? You got to get the ships to Brazilian ports. You got to rearrange all the logistics lanes. That was happening already. Pandemic made it worse. And now the war makes it uh, even worse than that. Yeah, the world is breaking up. Uh, we're decoupling. We're, globalization is over. 
there'll be a new form of it. Uh, it's not the end of world trade, but you're going to see, you know, maybe the the five eyes, you know, UK, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and friends in Western Europe form uh, a new trading block, but exclude China and Russia. It'll be a little bit more like the Cold War. I talked to Paul Walker about this, but here's what happened in the 70s. Now, it started as cost push inflation. It was the Arab oil embargo in 1973 after the 1973 war, the Israel Arab War. Uh, then the Arabs threw the embargo on us. The price of oil quadrupled. It went from $3 a barrel to $12 a barrel. It sounds cheap, but that's a 300% increase. And then uh, we had a severe stock market crash and recession in 1974, which at the time was the worst since the Great Depression. We've had worse ones since, but at the time that was the worst recession since the Great Depression. Then we come out of that and along comes the Fed, you know, and um, we went off the gold standard. Nixon uh, had an easy monetary policy in 72. It was a little earlier for his reelection effort, et cetera. So here comes the inflation. But what happened along the way, and then you had another Arab oil, actually an Iranian oil embargo in 1979 after the Ayatollah took over. So there were there were double oil shocks. That was a supply-driven cost push inflation. But along the way, it morphed into demand pull. It, it morphed into a demand-driven inflation. And I, I lived through it. I mean, I was a young up-and-coming lawyer at Citibank and a senior officer living in New York City. And that was the world where if you wanted anything, new furniture, TV set, vacation, whatever, you ran out, you dropped everything, ran out and did it because the price was going up so fast. So that's instructive in two ways. Number one, um, it shows that the Fed's always behind the curve. It shows that these things can persist a lot longer than people expect. But in my view, most importantly, because I think things are going to happen more quickly now, it shows inflation morphing from cost push to demand pull, morphing from something on the supply side to a psychological shift on the consumer side. And Volcker crushed it, but um, at a huge cost. Unemployment mm -hmm. was uh, about 11 percent. He took interest rates to 20 percent. How does that feel? You know, mortgagors and student loan holders and uh, others, you know, 20 percent. You talk about 40 percent on credit cards in that world. And people forget, you know, well, it doesn't inflation, don't you have high growth or whatever, at least or low unemployment? No, we had stagflation. We had inflation and high unemployment. There were three recessions between 1974 and 1982. We had three, 1974, 1980 and 1981, which lasted until 1982. And by the way, uh, people lost confidence in the dollar. In the late 70s, Jimmy Carter's treasury issued what they call Carter bonds. The U.S. Treasury issued debt in Swiss francs. Now, it was treasury debt. You had the treasury credit, but it was denominated in Swiss francs because nobody wanted dollars. That's how bad things were. 